Good morning. I'm Dr. Jamie Burkle with the Piedmont Heart Institute. This is uh, Cardiology Grand Rounds. I'm a uh, cardiovascular consultant with the Piedmont Heart Institute with a practice focused on cardiac imaging, prevention, metabolism, and lipids. Today's talk is on cardiometabolic therapies. I'll be talking to you about this important uh, topic and how this applies to our patients with cardiovascular risk. I'll be focusing specifically on arguably the most important new class of cardiovascular medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors. These are my disclosures, um, part of the Speakers Bureau at Beringer, Ingelheim, and Amgen. So let's start with the definition. Cardiometabolic syndrome is a combination of metabolic dysfunctions, mainly characterized by insulin resistance, impaired glucose tolerance, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and central adiposity. This is a very prevalent disease. 58% of patients with coronary artery disease have more than three metabolic risk factors in terms of the metabolic syndrome. Hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes account for 92% of morbidity and mortality amongst coronary artery disease patients. And this is something that increases with age. Uh, as you can see the prevalence, over 50% of males under, uh, over age 70 have the metabolic syndrome and over 70% of female patients have the metabolic syndrome uh, after the age of 70. The metabolic uh, risk and key considerations are the following. These patients have increased visceral fat, uh, insulin resistance, they have atherogenic dyslipidemia characterized by increased triglycerides, low HDL, and small dense LDL particles. They often have hypertension, glucose intolerance, uh, whether it's in impaired glucose tolerance or full type 2 diabetes. They have impaired fibrinolysis with increased PI-1 and fibrinogen. They have inflammation characterized by increased uh, C-reactive protein. They also have the uh, polycystic uh, ovarian syndrome characterized by a decrease in sex hormone binding lobulin and increased free testosterone. And they also have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, all of this contributing to increased cardiometabolic risk. And these patients also have multiple uh, risk factors, including insulin resistance, uh, obesity, physical inactivity, abnormal lipid metabolism, hypertension, and in many instances, smoking and age, uh, race, sex, and family history, all of them increasing cardiovascular risk. So what are the treatment goals when treating patients with cardiometabolic syndrome? First is reduction of mortality. Then is reduction of major adverse cardiac events followed by lipid and blood pressure control, organ protection, specifically with kidneys and eyes, glucose control, and weight control. We know that thanks to a um, large number of randomized prospective clinical trials, we have a number of drugs that have been proven to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality amongst patients with diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. These include ACE inhibitors or ARBs, which have, be, have been shown in clinical trials to reduce all-cause mortality by 13 to 15 percent, and they have shown also a 17 to 20 percent reduction in cardiovascular mortality. This is the reason why, unless contraindicated, we prescribe ACE inhibitors or ARBs to all our diabetic patients. Same thing applies to statins. Data from uh, randomized clinical trials have shown us that 32 to 34% reduction of all-cause mortality is observed in patients uh, who are prescribed statins in the setting of diabetes. And this result in a 21 to 24% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, uh, cardiovascular mortality. Therefore, this is also an indication for um, patients with diabetes unless contraindicated. And now we have two new classes of drugs that have shown in an improvement in cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And these are the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, which uh, clinical trials have demonstrated a 13 to 26 percent reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. And the SGLT2 inhibitors, which have resulted in 17 to 38 percent reduction in cardiovascular death and a 7 to 14 percent reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. So how did we get here? You might remember that back in 2008, when uh, rosiglitazone was approved by the FDA, resulted in a significant increase uh, 
in cases of congestive heart failure, hospitalizations, and cardiovascular death. As a result, the drug was recalled and the FDA mandated that all uh, anti-diabetic drugs should have an additional parallel arm uh, for major adverse cardiac events uh, versus the control group. And the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval for the hazard ratio had to be less than 1.8 for pre-marketing study and pre-marketing studies and less than 1.3 for post-marketing studies. So these are now the new classes of anti-diabetic drugs available. The TCDs or thiosolidindions uh, end in glitazone, the DPP4 inhibitors that have the ending gliptin, the GLP-1 receptor agonist with the ending on gl uh, glutide, and the SGL2 inhibitors with an ending on glyphosin. Only these two classes of drugs have demonstrated cardiovascular uh, benefits as far as reduction in morbidity and mortality, the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the, G, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So let's talk about GLP-1 receptor agonists. There are seven GLP-1 receptor agonists that have been approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in the United States. These are exenatide, liraglutide, lixisenatide, dulaglutide, semaglutide, oral semaglutide, and albiglutide. From these, only these three have demonstrated a reduction in morbidity and mortality in randomized clinical trials, liraglutide, semaglutide, and albiglutide. So how do this drug work? Well, these drugs are um, incretin mimetics. That is, after uh, food reaches the small intestine, the uh, enterocytes secrete GLP-1 in response to food, and this has three major mechanisms of action. In the brain, decreases appetite, in the stomach, slows gastric emptying, and in the pancreas, stimulates insulin secretion and suppresses glucagon secretion. There are basically three large randomized clinical trials that have demonstrated a benefit of GLP-1 receptor agonist in cardiovascular outcomes. The leader trial with liraglutide demonstrated a 13% reduction in the primary outcome of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or stroke for liraglutide compared to placebo. The sustained six and the Pioneer six trials with semaglutide demonstrated a 26% and a 21% reduction respectively in the three component maze endpoint as defined as cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal stroke. And finally, the Harmony trial with albiglutide demonstrated a 22% reduction in the primary outcome of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, or stroke. What are the mechanisms of this cardioprotective effects of GLP-1 receptor agonist? These include renal protection, lowering uh, chronic inflammation, glucose reduction, of course, and a reduction in ectopic fat deposition, which is known to affect insulin resistance and to associate with, which is associated with cardiovascular risk. GLP-1 receptor agonists are administered daily or weekly by injections. It can be administered with or without food, and the titration of these are for A1C reduction, but not for cardiovascular protection. In other words, the cardiovascular protection experienced by these drugs are noted from the starting dose. These are the doses of liraglutide, semaglutide, albiglutide, and oral semaglutide. And I recommend uh, my referring physicians to uh, familiarize with one drug and learn everything about dosing and titration. So in summary, GLP-1 receptor agonists result in a 13 to 26% reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. Moving on now to the SGLT2 inhibitors. We know uh, these drugs now as the new statins. There are four sodium glucose co-transported 2 inhibitors approved by the FDA for the treatment of type 2 diabetes in the United States. These are empaglifosin, dapaglifosin, canagliflozin, and ertroglyphlosin. How do they work? This is the mechanism of action. These drugs um, work in the proximal tubule of the nephron, and um, the SGLT2 uh, receptor is in the, located, like I said, in the proximal tubule, and is uh, 
responsible for the absorption of sodium and glucose. In fact, 98% of the glucose that reaches the proximal tubule through the glomerular filtration rate is absorbed through this receptor. This is what we call a secondary active transport receptor. It uses the energy from the ATP, from the sodium potassium ATPase, in order to absorb glucose against a gradient. The SGLT2 inhibitors then prevent this pump from working and induce significant glucoresis and natriuresis. So what are the clinical effects of SGLT2 inhibitors? This include enhanced urinary glucose excretion, a loss of 400 plus calories in the urine, which result in weight loss, significant natriuresis with intravascular volume contraction, blood pressure reduction, weight reduction, and hemoglobin A1C reduction. There are three drugs that have demonstrated cardiovascular benefit on large prospective randomized clinical trials. These are empagliflozin with the EMPAREC trial, canagliflozin with a CANVAS trial, and dapagliflozin with a declared TIMI-58 trial. This right here is the primary outcome result of the EMPAREC trial that randomized patients to empagliflozin versus placebo, both groups uh, in addition to standard of care for patients with diabetes, and this demonstrated a 14% reduction in the three-point maze of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke. Now, if you look at the key secondary endpoint of cardiovascular death, administration of empagliflozin resulted in a 38% reduction in cardiovascular death compared to placebo. And this astounding result caused the investigators uh, to be really surprised about this finding. And because of this, these drugs have now become standard of care and management of patients with diabetes. The canagliflozin trials, um, called the CANVAS trial, also demonstrated a significant reduction in cardiovascular uh, death, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. And you can see here the Kaplan-Meier curves demonstrate that these curves started early to separate early on the trial and remain separated for the duration of the trial. The same applies for death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal stroke, or non-fatal MI. For dapagliflozin, the declared TIMI-58 trial demonstrated a reduction in cardiovascular death as well as heart failure hospitalizations with a 17% reduction. You can see in the graph on the left. And the MAIS, major adverse cardiac events that included cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and non-fatal stroke was also reduced by 7% as demonstrated on the graph on the right. If you look at the specific uh, endpoints, cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke in the declared TIMI-58 trial, administration of dapagliflozin resulted in an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.04 uh, and for cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations, on the, uh, the right, you can see that the adjusted hazard ratio was 1.6. So in summary, SGLT2 inhibitors result in a 17 to 38% reduction in cardiovascular death and a 7 to 14% reduction in cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. What is most interesting about these new classes of drugs is that the benefits go beyond cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. In fact, now we are uh, based on large randomized clinical trials. We have now observed a reduction or an or in, um, indication for patients with heart failure, even without diabetes, for patients with renal failure, peripheral arterial disease, and even in atrial fibrillation. So how did we get here as far as heart failure? Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors prevent the development of heart failure in patients with type 2 diabetes. So the question is, can they be used to treat patients with established heart failure? And also, because the benefit may be uh, glucose independent, the question was, can SGLT2 inhibitors be used to treat patients without type 2 diabetes? And thanks to this background, two large randomized clinical trials were conducted, the DAPA-HF and the Emperor reduced trial, with dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. The DAPA-HF trial 
studied patients with symptomatic heart failure, left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%, and an intermittent pro-BMP of greater than 600. Patients were excluded if they had a GFR less than 30, symptomatic hypotension or systolic blood pressure less than 95, or the presence of type 1 diabetes. And these are the results. On the left, you can see that administration of dapagliflozin on top of standard of care results in a 30% reduction in worsening heart failure event compared to placebo. And on the right, it demonstrated an 18% reduction of cardiovascular death. As far as the secondary endpoint of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, administration of dapagliflozin resulted in a 25% reduction of this endpoint. All-cause death was uh, reduced by 17% with apagliflozin compared to placebo. In the case of empagliflozin, the Emperor Reduced trial was presented by Milton Packer at the European Society of Cardiology meeting last year, demonstrated that administration of empagliflozin on top of standard of care compared to placebo resulted in a 25% reduction in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure. And this right here, you can see that the same thing, the Kaplan-Meier curve separate early on the trial and remain separated for the duration of the trial. As a result, SGLT2 inhibitors now are part of the 2020 ACC AHA, AHA heart failure guidelines. And as you can see here, on patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, stage C, in addition to an ARNI and an evidence-based beta blocker, these drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors, now can be added for patients who meet the EGFR uh, criteria, and they are at the same level as drugs like mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist, diuretics, uh, hydralazine nitrates, or ivabridine. So moving on now to renal function, these drugs also have demonstrated significant benefit in patients with chronic kidney disease. This paper in Lancet actually did a meta-analysis and a systematic review of the clinical trials on SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease. So SGLT2 inhibitors have multiple benefits and the most important one being a decrease in intraglomerular pressure. Similar to ACE inhibitors, uh, when you first administer these drugs, you will see a slight decrease in GFR, which is the hemodynamic effect of the drug, followed by a stabilization of renal function compared to placebo patients that exhibit a typical progressive decline in renal function. These are the physiologic changes that have been observed in the kidney after the administration of SGLT2 inhibitors. In the tubular function area, in, uh, result in increased glucosuria, increased natriuresis, and a decrease in proteinuria. As far as the glomerular hemodynamics, these drugs result in an increased afferent arteriolar vasoconstriction, an increase in tubuloglomerular uh, feedback, and most importantly, a decrease in the intraglomerular pressure. The systemic hemodynamics Effects include a decrease in blood pressure, decrease in plasma volume, decrease in arterial stiffness, and possibly an improvement in energy utilization. This um, Forrester plot will show you that in all these clinical trials, the Credence, the Declare, Declare TIMI 58, CANVAS, and the EMPAREG outcome trials have demonstrated that SGLT2 inhibitors improve renal function compared to placebo. And this is data from the recently published DAPA-CKD trial, which administered uh, dapagliflozin in patients with chronic kidney disease, and clearly shown that initial administration of dapagliflozin results in a slight decrease in renal function, or GFR, followed by stabilization over the long term, compared to placebo patients that exhibit a progressive decline in renal function. And this is whether the patients have established cardiovascular disease or not, the graph on the left demonstrates that administration of dapagliflozin results in a significant reduction in worsening renal failure by the primary endpoint, which is a, a GFR decline greater than 50% end-stage kidney disease or, cardio, or kidney cardiovascular death. 
And on the right, you can see the secondary endpoint, which was heart failure, hospitalization, or cardiovascular death, which was also decreased with dapagliflozin compared to placebo, both in patients with cardiovascular disease or without. And this is the reason why this drug is becoming one of their favorites for our nephrology colleagues because of the significant benefit in preservation of renal function. Um, the empagliflozin um, trial, EMPAREC trial, also demonstrated that initial administration of empagliflozin resulted in a slight decrease in glomerular filtration rate followed by a stabilization in the long run compared to, again, a progressive decline in renal function on patients treated with placebo. There's an ongoing clinical trial called the EMPA kidney trial, which is a randomized double-blind placebo controlled trial of empagliflozin versus matching placebo in 6,000 patients with chronic kidney disease with or without diabetes. This trial will continue for about three to four years and will assess the uh, if empagliflozin reduces the risk of kidney disease progression or cardiovascular death. The trial results are expected in October of 2022. Finally, there's uh, been, uh, evidence now that SGL22 inhibitors also reduce the incidence of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. This is data from the declared TIMI58 uh, trial that showed that dapagliflozin resulted in a 19% uh, reduction of new onset atrial fibrillation compared to placebo in patients uh, that received the drug. And if you compare atrial fibrillation and flutter outcomes by major subgroups, whether the patient had a history of atrial fibrillation or flutter, patient had coronary artery disease, or patient had heart failure, all these patients showed a significant reduction in the incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation or flutter compared to placebo. So how can they have multiple cardiovascular benefits? That's really the question. There are three proven mechanisms of the benefit of SGL2 inhibitors in cardiovascular in the cardiovascular system. First is volume contraction, which result in preload reduction. The second one is a lowering blood pressure effect, which results in afterload reduction. And the third one is a decrease in glomerular pressure, which sends signals to the brain to decrease sympathetic outflow. Again, these are proven mechanisms, but there are also some mechanisms under investigation. The first refers to the myocardial energetics. Uh, Ferranini uh, and his uh, group of investigators have talked about how SGLT2 inhibitors induce a uh, mild ketotic state. And it turns out that the most uh, common ketone found in the body after administration of these drugs is beta-hydroxybutyrate, which provides better fuel to the myocardium than glucose. And that appears to be a significant benefit, especially in patients with heart failure. Uh, Sabun Burma and his group of investigators in Toronto um, support the theory that is the volume contraction and the increase in erythropoietin levels what causes an increase in the hematocrit of about 2 to 3 percent resulting in improved oxygen delivery and therefore cardiovascular benefit. And finally we have the group of uh, Sherney et al that basically say that it's all about the kidney, that the renal protective effects uh, result in improved hemodynamics, vasodilation, lower intravascular volume, etc. There's an additional uh, mechanism of action that has been investigated now. It turns out that there's SGLT1 receptors uh, in the myocardium, and it turns out that this receptor promotes apoptosis and fibrosis similar to aldosterone. So as you can see, there's multiple uh, effects that, that are directly impact myocardial function. The sodium, sodium hydrogen exchanger, uh, a decrease in calcium calmodulin kinase 2. Uh, there's also evidence of mitophagy and autophagy. And there's also a very important effect on reduction of the NLRP3 inflammasome, which is the same um, protein that is targeted by drugs like canicunimab and colchicine that have demonstrated a significant reduction in inflammation in patients with atherosclerosis. And in the bottom, you can see that uh, there are indirect and systemic effects of these SGL2 inhibitors that improve renal function, increase provascular uh, progenitor cells, increase epoietin, a decrease in um, sympathetic nervous system, and improved energetics.
So all these appear to be beneficial effects in the cardiovascular system. So these drugs are administered once daily with or without food. They should be titrated for A1C reduction but not for cardiovascular protection. So once again, the cardiovascular benefits are observed at the starting dose of the drug. Um, these are the doses of the three FDA approved drugs for cardiovascular reduction, empagliflozin 10 and 25 milligrams, dapagliflozin 5 and 10 milligrams, and canagliflozin 100 and 300 milligrams. The most common side effects reported with SGLT2 inhibitors include hypotension and volume depletion, prerenal exotemia, urinary tract infections, vaginal uh, yeast infections, candidal balanitis in uncircumcised patients. And um, very important to know that these drugs do not cause hypoglycemia by themselves unless combined with sulfonylurea or insulin. We have developed a Piedmont Heart Institute protocol for the use of SGLT2, SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with type 2 diabetes. And this list is listed here in this slide. So start by asking, does the patient have established ASCVD? That is, patients have coronary artery disease with whether st they have stable angina, PCI, or cabbage, cerebral vascular disease, or peripheral vascular disease. If the answer is no, then defer treatment of type 2 diabetes to the primary doctor or endocrinologist or if the patient has at least one of the following, dyslipidemia, hypertension, or tobacco use, if the answer is no, then that patient uh, should be deferred to PCP or endocrine, but if the answer is yes, you need to look for a contraindication for an SGLT2 inhibitor, which will be an allergy, type 1 diabetes, presence of DKA, hypoglycemia, a GFR less than 30 initially, although the DAPA CKD is showing us now that we can safely administer these drugs if the GFR is as low as 25. History of necrotizing fasciitis, recurrent UTIs or genital yeast infections, or hypotension. If the answer is yes, we need to avoid SGLT2 inhibitors. If the answer is no, we should initiate empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, or canagliflozin at the starting dose. Uh, we have put an, uh, an arrow there to consider adding metformin because, uh, as you know, these patients will greatly benefit from this drug as well. Important points to consider. Always assess volume status. Avoid if the patient is volume depleted. Educate on hygiene and hydration is critical for these patients. Adjust diuretic doses in many instances to prevent volume depletion. Monitor GFR every three months. And consider up to training dose if additional A1C is desired. So these are practical considerations once we start administering these drugs to our patients. We need to educate about diabetes and cardiovascular disease and why it's so important to add these drugs to their armamentarium. Uh, hygiene and hydration are critical in these patients. Consider adjusting diuretic doses, like I said, to prevent volume depletion. Communicate with your primary doctor or endocrinologist to clarify that you're not taking over management of diabetes, but rather you are actually administering drugs with cardiovascular benefits. And finally, monitor GFR every three to six months after you start therapy. The patients who benefit the, benefit the most from SGLT2 inhibitors are all diabetics with ASCVD. Therefore, based on the current clinical data, this has become a standard of care. This drug should be prescribed to all diabetics with ASCVD unless contraindicated. Most heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction that is an EF of less than 40%, with an eGFR greater than 30, and possibly uh, we can go as low as 25 based on DAPA CKD. Obese patients, and obviously patients with evidence of fluid overload or edema. Patients in whom we need to avoid prescribing SDLT2 inhibitors, those are patients with marginal blood pressures, or those patients who are orthostatic or with evidence of volume depletion. My final message to you is take ownership. These are cardiovascular drugs with anti-diabetic effects and not anti-diabetic drugs with cardiovascular effects. Patients see cardiologists four times more often than, than their endocrinologist. So again, take ownership of this, take the initiative of starting these patients on therapy and don't wait for their endocrinologist to do it. Like I tell all my referring doctors, familiarize with one or two drugs from each class starting dose, titration, side effects, etc., and get, get comfortable prescribing it. And if in doubt, ask, but don't withhold these life-saving drugs. I want to thank you for your attention.
and um, we'll be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Thank you.